Ever since I have known Charlene Gorzella, she has always had her hand in some kind of personal development or spiritual development. So I was so excited when she said she was becoming an advanced grief recovery specialist. I thought, wow, there could not be a better time to be diving into this than now when so much processing has been done for people or not over the last year. And today she's going to tell us a little bit more about how she works with grief and give you some considerations of how you can do this work and make an impact in changing your life. It's so wonderful to have you here, Charlene. Well, glad I'm here today, Kim. Thank you so much. And I respect and admire you so much. What you're doing with, hey, you know, I wrote a book and I think it's it's just the time has come that they need someone like you. I've worked for, with you before as a producer and, you know, nobody better or more sure, sure footed than you to do this kind of work and to help people. I've referred people to you who loved you. I still love you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, we're here to talk about you. We're here to talk about you. Okay, so let's get into it. These steps that you take people through. I thought it was really amazing that you talked about going from unresolved to resolved. Tell us a little bit more how that works with grief. Well, you know, it's funny. I'm going to tell you about an article that was up that came out by NBC during this COVID time. They said the third pandemic will be grief. And my goal wow. is there's a movement out there and I am part of it. I've always been involved in the human potential movement. And mm -hmm. people go, you're going to be in grief? I go, I don't see that with you. I see you more Anthony Robbins and all that kind of stuff. But I was like, you know what? Grief. I have a podcast, as you know, called Grief Recovery Now. And it's about the recovery part of grief. And yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, I'm 12 steps for 33 years, and I've always been in the human potential, doing more than you think you can. And, you know, right. and the filters we walk around in, people think grief is just about losing a loved one through death. There's a lot of losses out there. And I didn't know. Oh, yeah. On so many, on so many levels. So tell me about these filters. Like, how do they get rid of some of these filters? Well, well explain a little bit more about simple that. simple yet powerful steps you take. It's like, how can I say? Discovery, we're all into, which is needed, support groups or therapy. Discovery is not recovery. We can know all kinds of things mm. about ourselves. I know people have been in therapy for 30 years talking about their story. The same. The same. Yeah. Wow. And just remember, discovery is not recovery. It's a piece of the process. This is a yeah. proven uh, modality. Edu it's an educational modality. And I take people through a seven to eight week sessions, one a week for about an hour or so, one for a one-on-ones, and then for a group, it would be eight weeks or two two hours for eight weeks. And I tell you, go through certain steps to get to the unresolved to the resolve and the complete to the incomplete to the complete. And this is going through, you have to do your own work. I'll guide you through there. I'll moderate you through there lovingly. All I am is a heart with ears. And to give you the tools that you can use to get to a life beyond your wildest dreams. And there's losses yeah. like myself, as you know, I owned a company for 26 years. And then after I sold my company, I, the second year into selling it, I was like, what's going on? I was feeling very uncomfortable, sad. I was in a grieving process. I lost my identity in my mind, lost my identity. I missed the continuity the certainty. I had so much uncertainty on my next steps, trying the unknown, the unknown, stepping into the stepping into the unknown. I can understand why someone would look at you and say, you know, Charlene, you're always so up. You're always so joyful. You're always like, God is my source. You know, it would be, it's like grief, really? Like, isn't grief really heavy? But this is the thing is like to get to the joy, to get to the other side, we got to do the discovery work and be willing to talk about what's holding us back. You know, when we talked about doing this interview, you had mentioned your father 
And you had mentioned unresolved grief that you had about losing him so young and how it had affected all your romantic relationships that you had. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Because I think that's probably, I mean, it's interesting to me. I can't be the only one. It's interesting well, to I have to tell you, through my life, I've been married. I've had multiple relationships. And I was wondering, why don't I have a relationship that stands the te test of time? And while I was married, I got divorced, just to let you know. And... What I realized, and then I started doing some attachment theory work. I did my grief work, attachment theory work. It's like stuff that all the way back into childhood. And my father died when I was 16. Mm. At that time, I was whooping and hollering with my friends. I did. I wasn't relating to my father. He was, I loved my father. And I thought at that time, I remember as young, if I ever lost my father, I want to go before my parents do. Because I, I knew in my heart it was going to be devastating for me. Because you learn about death when you're younger. And right. But I've never heard anybody say that. I want to die before my parents. I, I don't know. Because usually it's parents saying, usually it's parents saying, like a big thing for parents, I know for me, is God, please don't let my children die before Yeah, me. but that thought, I remember being in my kitchen in Chicago as a young kid. Like, I know I had this moment of love for my parents and thinking, I don't want to lose them. Or I didn't even know if I said I want to die or I don't want to experience that. As a, It felt yeah. like that emotional pain, mm -hmm. I didn't want it. And so, and then I didn't have that father daughter, you know, where you feel like that's your first love, he's your first, you know, daughters want to marry their fathers. I didn't quite have that, but I was drinking and all that when I was a kid at 16. So I never got close and he died of a sudden heart attack. Aww. And then my mother died when I was 29. And so what I realized is I don't, I didn't want to get so deep with someone. I wasn't all in. I thought I was in these relationships. And I also, when I did this attachment theory work, there's about relationships and there's um, rights in relationships. And there's one right, which is you have a right to separate and belong and be in a we in a relationship. He told me this PhD doctor said, Charlene, you have separate down path. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's true. When I met you, when I met you eight, seven plus years ago, I was like, she is the most independent woman I know. She's got her, she, she bought her own house. She's selling a business. She's creating this TV show, which is what we worked on together. She's like sober 900 years. She's amazing. Right. But I do remember like, you'd be like dating guys and you'd be like, oh yeah, no, not happening. And so now you're with someone very special who you're saying is someone you're going to spend the rest of your life with. And it, it's not coincidental. It's right after this work, right? Oh, most definitely something shifted. I didn't realize I was walking through this filter of my own filter. And I did the work just like this grief recovery work. I did the attachment theory stuff. I did the grief work on my father and discovered this stuff. And it wasn't like, oh my God, this is why I'm not in a relationship. It was the, the, the getting resolved and complete with my father. And it's a right. sacred, to me, grief, I'm in it because in this work, because it is a sacred time in life. It's a horrific time, traumatizing, heartbreaking, but it's sacred work. And we all go through it. And I mentioned this to you before. We're taught how to get. We are not taught how to lose. Ooh, I love that. That has a lot of impact. You're right. You're right. It's completely imbalanced. Mm -hmm. I see that mm -hmm. now. And go I want to and I want to go back to what you said about the listening piece. Um, you know, you and I are are similar in the way that we're not therapists. Mm -hmm. You know, people come to you and they want to share their story, and you're gonna take them through a process that's gonna get to them to the other side to hopefully get them what they want. People come to me to write a book. I am not a therapist, but a lot of times they're talking about some relationship they had with their mother that they've never shared. And sometimes they're like, Matt, it's messy, right? But all I can really do is hold space and keep them on target for the goal, which is the book. And for you, it's to get through, through grief. So how do you not, you're such a like, you know, I know that you're, you know, because you have recovery for so long in, in 12 step, you're good with this, but how do you not give advice? You know what? It's ask the questions. I've always been curious of them to 
mm-hmm. in their self. I see myself as part of their transition team to their next yeah. greater yes yet to be. I say this about people who transition out of a life. And he says, oh, they're off to their greater yet to be when they they leave the body, right? But I also think here on the planet, when you're birthing something, they're transitioning into something else. And so I'm just sort of this way shower and giving you the tools. I don't do the work for you. I give you the right. tools and you discover it for yourself. Same thing as a lot of therapists do too. But this is practical stuff right. that blew my mind. You go over one thing. I don't like to talk about what we go through in the uh, process, but one of the things we do is you do a timeline. Mm, and when you do that that's timeline, right. You mentioned that. You're like, it, it reminded me of something I did a while ago where it's like, I had to do a timeline every 10 years. I was like, how am I going to do that? Well, I just started writing. And the thing I have here is like, get out of your head and into your heart. We intellectualize our grief. Once you get mm-hmm. to the language of the heart, even if you hear it just through yourself for the first time and the revelations, that's where the the um, the change starts happening and the shifting starts happening and the fullness starts happening. It's not this free floating anxiety that you're not even you're so used right. to living. It's chronic, right? But you're so right. used to it, and your nervous system is so used to it. And there's also steps that. You go through what I'll take you through that will get you to the other side. I did the grief work and I didn't cry through the whole thing. All of a sudden, the end, I was like, (laughs) (laughs) that's, that's because you were in student, you were in student mode, you know? And then, and then when you get to the end, the, the epiphany of what you've just done, the work you've just done, the honoring, the self honoring. One thing I wanted to bring up is this, you know, punch a few holes in it, in the whole grief Mm -hmm. process is there are people that like to stay in victim mode, right? So you can, you can offer them all the solutions in the world and you can just hear it. You're like, oh, they just want to stay because that's part, that's their greatest story, right? If someone comes to you and you get that sense, have you ever said to someone, I don't think you're ready for this work? They'll tell me, I never want to tell somebody they're not ready. Because if they're talking to me and they say yes, then they're ready. I had a friend who's also an advanced grief recovery specialist. She's been doing it for a long time. But she was sexually abused from two years old until I think she was 10. They were like in a Mm, sex Part of my story. Yeah. And yeah she became right. a meth addict years later, an executive that did meth for two years while working and functioning. Well, a friend of her said, if you don't do this, I'm going to pay for it and you're going to do it. I'm going to make you do it. Well, she went to do the grief recovery method towards the sixth week or seventh week or whatever, because she was in a group. She was like, oh my, because she was kicking and screaming, her arms crossed, but you know, determined to do the work to show it won't work for her because she thought she was too complicated. At the end, she was like, oh my God, this works. This works. Because <laughs> it's a build. And then all of a sudden you start doing things. You think, oh, so something starts percolating and you got to stay in the moment through it. And it's all in your attention. But she didn't want to do it. She kicked and screamed. And then she, well, work. isn't that, isn't that part of the barrier though? What you just said is that I'm so unique. My story is so unique. There's no way that I can go through this process. Like, don't you know who I am? Don't you know what I've been through? It's so much. And it's this, that's the ego trying to protect you from going into places that the ego doesn't think you can handle. So you have to just say, look, I got this. Like, we're doing this whether you like it or not, because I want to get better. I want to be happy. I want to be happy, joyous, and free. I want to be on the other side, yeah. right? So tell me about writing. I know you're a creative person. Um, what is writing like for you? Because, you know, we talk about writing books on this show. I'll tell you about that book. Just to comment on what you just said, just know sure. they are ideas. People don't want to get grief recovery because they don't want to get better. They're afraid if they do grief recovery, they're going to forget about their loved one. They're going to forget about their story and dishonor them or disrespect them. They don't realize they're going to come out of it even in a more fullness. So they're in this like, I don't want to forget about my loved one. And so that's why they sometimes they stay in the story or the loss or they're afraid to, you know, go forward in life like you. They're a victim. They're they're their story. They are the 
story. Right. Well, not like me, yeah. but like I yeah. mentioned. Yeah, not like, like <laughs> I am said. victim no more. Like you said, you know, like, you're like, like you. Like people who write books. <laughs> Oh, well, what you just said, what you just said is actually, if you can believe it, one of the biggest th pieces of resistance that comes up for people when they go to write a book is they say, well, I don't really want to upset my family and I don't want to alienate people and I don't want to make them upset. I'm like, but you haven't even written the book yet. You're like 12 months away from pissing anybody off, you know? So let's go I'll back to about. writing. Let's go back to you. Tell me about you as a writer. Well, this is my writing and I'm like this in life. I've done one marathon in my life in running and it was brutal. I will never do it again. It was my first and last. But I was telling you the other day, I said, I am more of a sprinter. I like to write a page or two or even a half a page. And I'm the type of person and I'm not patting myself, you know, I'm a hit between the eyes person and I get spurts of inspiration and then I'll start writing. And I told you mm -hmm. that my book is going to be a purse pocket book type of book. Well, things that right. Well, that's not exactly what you said. You said it's on, it's, a, it's for on the pot too, say right? That. Put it on the side of the pot in your bathroom and, you know, take a pee. I don't know why, you know, people have libraries in there. Do it on the side of your, have yeah. it on the side of your bed stand, put it in your purse, read mm -hmm. it in the car. It's like that spurts of in inspiration. Right. You want to right. get, if you're so in your well, head, you're like, okay, I need to get an attitude adjustment. Like I used to go out to drink in the eighties. They call them the attitude adjustment hour. These little books that I'm going to write are like the little attitude or shifts in consciousness to get in the heart. Oh, I think that's great. Do you let, do you see yourself writing something longer someday about who you are involved, you know, integrated into the book, or are you pretty sure it's going to be these snippets? Well, so far that's what's coming through me. Cause it will talk about my life and my experiences because I'm higher learning spiritually. I've been with leaders of every kind of religion or spiritual wisdom that you can imagine. I mean, one time I went to Melbourne, Australia to go to the parliament of world religions and there was probably a thousand different kinds of religions. And I felt everyone, 6,000 people were my brothers and sisters. So I was talking to these <laughs> leaders, a six Kabbalah, you know, Maharajas, monks, you know, all these people, heads of Kabbalah, Catholic, Agape International Spiritual. You know, I love that. So I want to bring that too. And I can bring, I think I, I'd like to do a novel because I'm a novel reader. I love mm -hmm. Stories, that's how I learn. How so I maybe I'll have a book right. with lots of different stories in it. It's Short stories, yeah. perhaps. Right. And I love, I love I love your energy. I just think it's, you know, it's sort of, I always knew this, but it's like dawning on me real time in this interview. I'm like, what an interesting choice. Like you're such a, like, I can see you in the middle of those 6,000 people. And now you're like a grief recovery. It's just, it's so interesting how the hap, one of the happiest people is wanting to bring that joy to other people. And I want to end on this. So maybe you can give something for the audience to kind of leave with, and then they can get in touch with you if they want to do deeper work. But what is a sign that you see that that's an indicator that people are, are holding back grief and what would be a first step that they would take? Well, it would be like, what is baffling you about your life? It's like, like for me, it was the relationship thing. Right. So it's taking the look at that one, that one spot that you keep going. I've tried all these different things and it's not the external anymore. It's the internal. And so what, what would be one step they would take obviously besides cause if they're not so signed up yet that it's a grief, what would be one next step for them to know? I would say, and, and another thing, if you're eating a lot, you know, if you're emotional eating, that's, that's happening. If you're watching too much TV, you're just, you know, hampering your emotions and give it to your heart yeah. and just make a conscious decision. I'm going to get in my heart. It's hard when you're in your head. It's like, get on videos on zoom, just type meditation to get into your heart or something mm. and start getting other perspectives to change your paradigm. Get to your peers, find a grief group, 
you know, don't go down, you know, I mean, you're going to talk your story and you'll be in the discovery part and write, Kim, I love what you're doing and start writing and do a stream of consciousness. Just, I do a three part yeah. letter. I can say, why am I stuck? Mm -hmm. I, one time I says, why, you know, I'm lonely. You know, I remember one time I was feeling lonely and, you know, so I wrote about like, it's a three part letter. You write to the person, place or thing or situation like dear loneliness you know, let's say you start writing, dear loneliness, and you write a letter and you just start writing whatever comes through and it's in your subconscious and ask, ask spirit, your universal intelligent nature, whatever to help you through this. The second letter is to write a letter to God, nature, whatever is more than you that beats your heart. And then the next letter would be like, for me, it's God. God is my infinite intelligence. You know, I have my own version. And the third part letter is God's letter back to you. Start writing mm. and get off of yourself and just trust whatever comes through and do pen and paper. And if you want to write yeah. pages, a few pages or something, write a few pages, just start writing. You can just bitch and moan, excuse the language, and just say, I hate my fucking life. Or I am so mad. I can't figure this out because we want to figure out. Right. Absolutely. No, those are, those are, those are fantastic tips and we could, we I could know. talk about this all day long, but we have to, we have oh. to stop. It's been so nice to have you on the show. I appreciate your work that you're doing out in the world. And I know that you're going to change a lot of lives. So thank you. Thank well, you're you. You're welcome. And, and feelings mutual and um, thank you listeners. And I hope you got something out of it. I appreciate it. I appreciate you, Kim, so much. Goodbye. Goodbye.